what up my fellow world explorers welcome back to the channel today's video is going to be the part two of the napoleonic wars guys before we get into the video please if you haven't subscribed to the channel please i'm trying to get to 500 subscribers by the end of this month please if you haven't subscribed help me out get me to 500 subs at the end of the month also smash the like button it helps with the algorithm now let's get into the video After the Third and Fourth Coalition Wars, Napoleon had decisively defeated all three of his main rivals on the continent, and he was now undoubtedly the master of Europe. After the Battle of Friedland, his enemies sued for peace, and they all met on a raft on a river. That's really crazy for a so-called small man, quote-unquote small man, be able to take over the whole of Europe, except, of course, of course the pesky Brits. For negotiations, they had been fighting for the past four years, but now Napoleon and Alexander surprisingly got along like a house on fire. They laughed together, they chatted long into the night, they kissed. The two had a lot of mutual respect, and Napoleon even told his wife that if Alexander were a woman, I would make him my mistress. Kind of a weird thing to say to your wife, Napoleon. In the end, they came to an amicable agreement. Russia would lose barely any land, and in return, they'd join France against the UK and invade Sweden. Win-win. On the other hand, Frederick William III was sidelined, and Prussia lost an enormous amount of territory to French client states. Only the UK remained as the last major threat to Napoleon, and they continued to be a big thorn in his I'm side, you. constantly funding his enemies and using their powerful... I'm telling you, the pesky Brits, like, these guys were just... I mean, from at what, from what point did the, the British really just start being so pesky? Like... When they were, you know, history is a bit, you know, but at what point did the Brits just like, okay, we are now going to be the the main players of the world? At what particular, was it like the 1100s or the, like, was it AD, sorry, was it in the BCs? I mean, like, I mean, being an island is also, also helps. Navy to wreak havoc on French trade and overseas colonies. But what could Napoleon do? The British were safe across the channel. Yeah. Well, he said, if I can't fight you with guns, I'll fight you with money. Earlier in 1806, Napoleon had announced the continental system, a total shutoff of the UK from continental trade. No one in Europe was to trade with Britain, hmm. and Napoleon hoped that by hitting their economy, he could force them to negotiate. The British economy did take a hit, and they responded in their typical fashion. By going to Copenhagen, I'm <laughs> blowing a bunch of stuff up. <laughs> but in general, the British managed. <laughs> I mean, like the way the way he said it, like okay, uh, mm, just like how they usually do, just go blow some stuff up. <laughs> the Brits to stay afloat by simply increasing their trade with other parts of the world. Many neutral countries found themselves stuck between a rock and a hard place as the two European superpowers demanded they cease trade with the enemy. Hey America, you better not trade with the French or else I'll come burn down the White House. <laughs> what? This is gonna wreck my economy. I need to start saving money. How the heck am I gonna start saving money? Oh yeah, making peace with the Russians, a continental blockade, and blowing up Copenhagen. Sick of being blown up for doing almost nothing, and under significant pressure from Napoleon, the Danish officially sided with France. But Napoleon's blockade had the biggest effect on continental Europe, who were now cut off from a major trading partner, one that controlled the seas and held a rich, growing empire. And a lot of countries didn't fully comply. Portugal, a traditional British ally, refused to take part. No problem. Napoleon sent an army <laughs> and invaded. But it wasn't just Portugal. Many of Napoleon's allies were also suspect. Your Majesty, it seems that Spain isn't properly enforcing your blockade. Spain? Why not? Well, it appears they've been trying to find a way out of being your ally since they lost their fleet at Trafalgar. What is with these people? It's almost like everyone's only pretending to be my ally because they know otherwise I'd beat them up. <laughs> Do I even have any real true. friends? Are you my friend, Pierre? Say yes or I'll slap you. Napoleon had come to mistrust his ally to the south. And in particular, Napoleon thought the Spanish royal family were an incompetent mess. All right, Carlos, you've got to get it together. How can I trust you when all you do is go hunting? Meanwhile, 
just nobody who dislikes me run the country. And you seem to be the only person in the universe who doesn't realize he's boinking your wife. And what's worse, Who the heck are you? I'm the king's son. I just overthrew my dad. So, actually, now I'm the king. You people are the biggest cluster of shameless, narcissistic idiots and all around just the worst people I've ever met. Here, have a Kids' Choice Award. French forces, <laughs> many having conveniently already entered Spain to invade Portugal, occupied Spanish forts, and Napoleon invited the Spanish royals to France to help mediate their differences. All right, we're here with the royal family of Spain. So, Fernando, you've been accused of plotting against your father and vying for the Spanish throne. What do you have to say for yourself? Well, Napoleon, I That's just think great. Well, I've got the test results right here. Fernando. In the case of the Spanish throne, you are not the king. <laughs> and Carlos, you are also not the king. I'm the I'm king. I'm the king. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Napoleon made his brother the king, but for all intents and purposes, Spain was now his puppet. He expected the Spanish people to be over the moon at the removal of their unpopular royal family. Imagine his surprise when it turned out that people don't really like to be subjugated by a foreign power, least of all one who had previously attacked the Catholic Church. And so the people of Spain revolted. Brutal fighting broke out as bands of armed Spaniards ambushed French troops across the kingdom, and vicious atrocities were committed on both sides. Damn. In addition to fighting the regular Spanish and Portuguese forces, the French had to contend with tens of thousands of guerrilla fighters throughout the Spanish countryside. The British even took the opportunity to land an army led by the future Duke of Wellington. And now, British forces were defeating French ones on land. Napoleon briefly went to Spain in person, and he did drive back the Allied armies. But before long, his attention was needed elsewhere. The whole thing became a nightmare for the Emperor. He excelled at traditional warfare, but this was something more akin to Napoleon's Vietnam. The whole conflict would keep hundreds of thousands of French soldiers and resources bogged down for years. Napoleon was never able to wow. break the will of the wait, Spanish wait, 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 people. Wait, wait, wait. And this 1807 to 1814, that is how many years? That is seven years. That is crazy. Damn. The problem weakened his position in Europe. <laughs> hey, Francis, want to go to war with Napoleon again? Oh, I don't know, Britain. He's already whomped me three times. I'll give you a bazillion pounds. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Seeing that Napoleon was now caught up in Spain, and with some British funding, Austria decided maybe, just maybe, this time, they'd have a chance. So did they? No. Fifth Napoleon defeated coalition. them in just four months. Damn. It was quick, but it wasn't exactly easy. The Austrians had been watching Napoleon and learning, and they had made some reforms. While Napoleon, after years of war, was increasingly having to rely on inexperienced conscripts. So this time, the Austrians gave him a run for his money. The Fifth Coalition saw some of the bloodiest battles to date, including Napoleon's first major defeat. And when he did finally defeat the Austrians at the Battle of Wagram, it was a very costly victory. Still, Napoleon had yet again kicked Francis's butt, <laughs> and as part of the peace terms, Austria lost a bunch more land. Not long after, no, however, no, Napoleon so and Francis small, no. came to another agreement. It was decided that Napoleon would marry Francis's young daughter. But wait, doesn't Napoleon already have a wife? Well, yes, he did. Josephine and Napoleon had become quite fond of one another, but now that Napoleon was playing the monarch game, he needed a male heir, and his aging wife wasn't giving him one. So it was out with the old and in with the new. At least he didn't behead anyone. For Austria, they felt that if Napoleon was going to keep on winning, they may as well be on his side. So through the marriage, Napoleon got an alliance with Austria and a beautiful baby potato. Between the failing blockade against Britain, the ongoing war in Spain, and now his recent struggles in Austria, cracks in Napoleon's invincibility were beginning to show. But still, look at this map. So blue, yeah. so beautiful. Even Sweden, after being pulverized by Russia, overthrew their king, and after an interesting chain of events, ended up putting one of Napoleon's own marshals in charge. Marshal Bernadotte took the name Karl Johan and became Crown Prince of Sweden hmm. after agreeing to join Napoleon's continental wow. system. For now, Sweden was Team France. Napoleon was on top of the world. He had won an endless string of victories. All he had to do now was sit back and not make any major miscalculations that could completely turn the tide of war. So let's see what comes next. <laughs> <laughs> France's alliance with Russia was a <laughs> Why do these people always make this mistake?
Why do they always do that? Like, I was, I was about to say it. I just didn't want to look stupid. I was about to say it. I knew it would be Russia. I just knew it. Why do these people? Hitler did the same thing. Like, why are you doing that? Anyway, let's see how this goes. Terrifying prospect. Together, the two could have been unstoppable. But unfortunately, the alliance didn't last. The Russians felt they weren't getting a fair deal. Napoleon's Duchy of Warsaw right on their doorstep was a bit of an insult. And then their economy began to tank because of Napoleon's British blockade. And eventually, they began to open up trade. Your Majesty, it seems Alexander is no longer abiding by the continental system and has begun trading with the British. Alexander? But he kissed me. He kissed me. <laughs> you wouldn't get it, Pierre. No one would ever kiss you. <laughs> the security of Napoleon's empire depended on removing the British threat, and he wasn't happy with Russia's backdoor shenanigans. And so in 1812, Napoleon decided to go to war. He gathered together the most massive army Europe had ever seen, Damn. made up of troops from every corner of his empire, and he prepared to invade. Okay, it looks like Napoleon's coming for us. Generals, I need ideas. We could stand and fight. No, that's stupid. You're stupid. We could run away. You. You're a star. You'll remember Napoleon's tactics relied on astonishing speed to outmaneuver his enemy and force a quick, decisive battle. Well, I've got two words for you. Scorched Earth. If his opponent retreated while scorching the earth, his men couldn't live off the land. And if his men couldn't live off the land, he needed his supply trains. And if he needed his oh, supply trains, he couldn't move quickly. That is, and if he that couldn't is, move quickly, is, he couldn't have That is genius. That is genius. Like, that is genius. Ah. Are you saying that the Russians actually rendered their land um, like obsolete? Is that the, is that the right word? Obsolete. Whatever, um, like to, just to make Napoleon soldier because from the first part of this video, it was said that one of Napoleon's tactics was is he, he, he like he will divide his troops into different factions that are basically kind of independent, and this this this, this factions could live on their own and they live on the land that they are like they inhabit those lands. And they live from those lands, like they eat from there and everything. So it seems like the Russians actually like destroyed their own land. Let me see. Let me see. That, that is interesting. That maneuver is enemy. I think you get the point. Napoleon launched his invasion and hoped for a quick battle, but all he could do was Losing try to catch men. the retreating Losing Russians men. while moving deeper and deeper into hostile territory. Ah. As he went, the horribly hot summer devastated his army. Ah. His men died of heat, exhaustion, and disease. Supplies began to run out and his men began to starve. Many deserted, and still the Russians continued to retreat. Numerous times, Napoleon considered turning back, but that little voice in his head you kept see? on telling him, keep going, Napoleon just complex. a little further. And don't worry, you're definitely average height for the time. <laughs> he nearly caught the Russians at Smolensk, but it was his birthday, so he had a party instead. When he finally reached Moscow, he predicted the Russians wouldn't be willing to give up such a historic and holy city without a fight, and he, was right. The Russians finally turned to face him for the single deadliest day of the Napoleonic Wars, the Battle of Borodino. The Russians fought valiantly, and as he got older, Napoleon's battle tactics seemed to become a little less refined and a little more run straight at the enemy, try not to die. He launched a full <laughs> frontal assault at the Russian defenses, and as a result, the death toll was colossal. The Russians eventually decided to retreat, leaving Moscow to fall into Napoleon's hands. Wow! Quick, the French are wow. taking the city, release all the Wow, that is that is that, wait. that is wait, that is that is. I'm speechless. It took it took Moscow. Wow. These prisoners immediately and tell them to burn it to the ground. Well, well, Jimmy the arsonist, you are not going to believe your luck. Moscow <laughs> went up in flames, and as Napoleon entered, it became very clear his army wouldn't be able to stay there very long. Wow. He had just defeated the Russian army and taken their most beloved city. In Wait, his Russia mind, he had down the So he sent Tsar Alexander in St. Petersburg crazy. a letter. Your Imperial Majesty, Napoleon requests your surrender. How shall I respond? You shan't, Dmitri. Ever? Ever. But, Your Majesty, it will be winter soon. The French forces are stuck 500 miles into Russian territory with dwindling supplies. If we don't say anything, well, 
then they'll all die. Oh! After waiting for a response for about a month, the first snow of winter began to fall, and Napoleon sensed the catastrophe that was about to unfold. Wow. He decided their only choice now was to get out. And that's when it happened. <laughs> it got cold. Stupid cold. This hey. glorious invasion had just become a race for survival. As the Russians realized the French were fleeing for their lives, they began to close in on their supply line. Men froze to death, hey. their horses as well. Wow. There was starvation and disease. The injured and dying could only be left by the side of the road, as it was too slow to try to carry them. And all along the way, the dreaded Russian Cossacks stalked the bleeding French army, and every now and then swept in for a quick attack. Napoleon, fearing capture, kept a vial of poison around his neck. At one point, the Russian armies nearly trapped him against the Berezina River. Hmm. But a little Napoleon cleverness gave him the old Jeffrey Duke, tricking them into thinking he was going south and then escaping across rapidly built pontoon bridges <laughs> to the north. When the Russians realized where he was and began to close in, the French burned the bridges before everyone could cross. Hundreds drowned and thousands were captured. At this point, Napoleon got wind of plots against him forming in Paris. So he abandoned his men and went back to France. The remaining French stragglers made it across Damn. the border. It's been estimated over 600,000 men went into Russia. Less than 100,000 returned. Napoleon was oh. now in a very precarious situation. His army had just been obliterated and the other European leaders smelled blood. Here was an opportunity to take advantage of a weakened Napoleon, regain territory and influence, and liberate Europe from his dirty French paws. And so they began to turn. Prussia soon broke their alliance and switched sides, while Austria declared neutrality. Even Sweden, led by one of Napoleon's old marshals, joined the Allies, wow. partly due to Napoleon's earlier invasion of Swedish Pomerania. The War of the Sixth Coalition had begun. The coalition forces had been reforming their armies, and they were now much better. And the UK had also significantly amped up its financial aid to its continental allies. Their armies quickly advanced through Poland and into Germany. In Paris, Napoleon was understandably freaking out. He needed to put together a new army fast, and he called up over 100,000 new conscripts, mostly teenagers. Hmm. He also put his factories into overdrive, and he was like, You, make more rifles. You, build new cannons. You, make more horses. I don't make horses. Then who makes horses? Horses make horses. Explain <laughs> how. Well, when a daddy horse and a mommy <laughs> horse love each other very much. Yes, go on. Well, then the daddy horse... I'm sorry, Napoleon. You're 43. I thought you'd know this stuff. Don't touch me! I'm gonna be sick. As it turned out, <laughs> Napoleon's lack of horses would take the biggest toll on his army, since his tactics relied on speed, maneuverability, and destruction. When he took the fight to the Allies in 1813, he did defeat them and sent them running. But lacking cavalry, he was unable to effectively pursue and destroy. He needed horses. For the Allies, being defeated in battle by a man whose army was now full of inexperienced conscripts was concerning. So mm -hmm. both sides were like, hold up, time out. The Allies were somewhat cornered, and had Napoleon kept going, it's possible he could have won. But instead he agreed to a brief truce with the Austrians mediating between the two sides. When Austria demanded Napoleon make major concessions, Napoleon told them to shove it. <laughs> Having had their terms rejected, Austria felt now they were justified in saying, well, we tried, and they joined the coalition. Okay, everyone. Look at us. The boys are back together. But Napoleon is still dangerous, so we need a plan. Any ideas? Hmm. Ooh, I know. Ah, no, forget it. That's stupid. Ah! Oh, no, 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 no. I've got it! When he approaches, we run away. Genius. He's a genius. <laughs> the plan was as follows. Wherever Napoleon advanced, whoever he advanced on would avoid battle, allowing the others to sweep into oh, the sides and fuck. attack the French marshals guarding his flanks. Damn. Essentially, the plan was, don't try to fight Napoleon. And this plan worked tremendously. It's work now. The Allies scored a number it's of work. victories that saw Napoleon move back to the city of Leipzig, where he would make one last major stand as the Allied armies converged in on him from all sides. The stage was set for the biggest and bloodiest battle of the Napoleonic Wars, the Battle of Leipzig. Almost half a million troops from over a dozen nations stretched across the battlefield. The French found themselves fighting on all sides for four days against the Austrians, Prussians, Swedes, and Russians. It's no wonder this, this battle crazy. is also sometimes referred to as the Battle of the Nations. The French fought ferociously, but ultimately were no match for the coordinated efforts of the coalition. At one point, in the midst of battle, Saxon troops allied with the French had a team huddle and were like, hey guys, I'm pretty sure the French are losing. Let's switch sides. And so they did. 
When it became clear that Napoleon couldn't win, he ordered a retreat across the only bridge over the river. The Allies swarmed into the city, and desperate fighting raged in the streets. Okay, Corporal, after everyone has crossed the river, I need you to blow up the bridge. Okay? Not before everyone's crossed. After. You got that? Yes, Colonel. I'm not five. I can comprehend time. Good. Wait. <laughs> did he say before or after? Well, fortune favors the bold. What? The bridge was blown early, and 30,000 French troops were stranded and fuck? captured. A disaster. And with that, the dominoes were beginning to come crashing down on Napoleon. In the south, an army under the British Duke of Wellington had been pushing the... F how, how did he make that kind of a mistake? He was given an order. And he made that kind of horrible mistake. That is crazy. French out of Spain for the past few years, and were now crossing into France. Austrian armies had pushed into Italy, while Napoleon's old flamboyant cavalry commander, Murat, who Napoleon had made king of Naples, decided to switch sides. German wow. states, many resentful after years under Napoleon's thumb, turned against him, and the Confederation of the Rhine That's collapsed. Crazy, Bernadotte invaded Everybody Denmark, just and they were forced to join the coalition, while the Netherlands were liberated. You'd think Napoleon might have seen the writing on the wall, but he Napoleon was complex. Napoleon, and so instead, he prepared to keep fighting. As attitudes in Paris were already beginning to turn against him, he called up more conscripts to defend the exhausted nation. As for the Allies, they weren't sure exactly what they were aiming for here. A few peace offers were floated that may have let Napoleon keep his position, but the British kept throwing around even more money, and eventually, they all agreed that the ultimate aim... You pesky Brits. You pesky Brits. <laughs> was the deposition of Napoleon entirely. And so, Napoleon embarked on one of his most famous campaigns to defend the homeland. He was completely outnumbered, but the Allied armies had split up and spread out. His army was so small that he could move at lightning speed, and he used this to his advantage. In the famous Six Days campaign against Prussian General Blücher, he attacked from all directions and defeated Blücher's forces wow. four times, only suffering a tenth of the casualties Damn. he inflicted. Even with his back completely to the wall, Napoleon this guy was, was this still guy was Napoleon. Legendary, man. Then he turned south to take on Schwarzenberg's Army of Bohemia and enjoyed even more victories. Hmm. However, Napoleon's problem was that he couldn't be everywhere at once, and wherever he wasn't, the Allies continued to push towards Paris. He made one last-ditch attempt at moving in behind the enemy lines and cutting off the... Does he have to be with his soldiers for them to fight effectively? I mean, like... ...their communications, but Paris was in disarray, and the people were sick of war. One ambitious and slightly treacherous politician sent the Allied armies a letter basically saying, Hey guys, come on in. And so, they did. The city's defenders surrendered, and as the Allied leaders entered Paris, the people cheered them as bringers of peace. Paris had fallen. Quick, marshals, gather your men. We're gonna launch an assault on Paris. What? Where are my marshals? They all left and told me to give you this note. Napoleon's marshals had realized what he hadn't. It was over, and they insisted all that was left now for the good of France was for him to abdicate, and without the support of his army, Napoleon had no choice. He hoped his son could take his place, but it was decided instead to restore the old Bourbon monarchy. Old King Louis XVI's brother would become the King of France. It was almost like the French Revolution had never even happened. <laughs> but what will we do with Napoleon? We can't have a hyperactive 44-year-old menace running around reigniting revolutionary ideals and plotting his return. Well, why don't we send him, mm, I don't know, there. The location chosen for Napoleon's exile was the small island of Elba, just off the coast of Italy. Napoleon was to rule over the island, and even got to keep the title Emperor of Elba. The Allies must have been in stitches when they came up with that. When he learned what his fate was to be, he drank the poison he had been keeping around his neck. But it had gone out of date, so instead of a quick and painless death, he got a painful stummy wummy instead. Before he left France, he addressed his oldest and closest guard one last time, making an emotional speech that ended with him kissing their flag. And off he went to exile. The deal that was given to him was actually quite generous. His family were given titles, he was to receive a state pension from France, and he was able to receive many distinguished visitors, all eager to come and meet the famed emperor. And he ruled over Elba well, improving infrastructure, hmm. and introducing many legal and social reforms aimed at improving life on the island. Hey, Napoleon, just coming in to check on how it's all going. Holy smokes! But it wasn't all good. For one thing, he learned of the death of his first wife, Josephine, and was deeply saddened. 
He was forbidden from seeing his son and current wife, and in Austria, Emperor Francis had ordered a local count to seduce her so she would forget about Napoleon. <laughs> then, the new King Louis XVIII refused to give Napoleon his agreed pension. He was under constant threat of assassination, and there were even rumors that the Allies were thinking of relocating him somewhere even more remote. But the biggest problem was that Napoleon was once the master of Europe. He had lived a thrilling life of adventure, fame, and glory. Now, he found himself on a tiny island in the Mediterranean, and he was bored. Wouldn't it be nice if he could somehow return to France and reclaim his throne? Hey, Napoleon, want to go back to France and reclaim your throne? I would, Pierre. But how? Well, I was thinking we could just take this boat. Will that work? Surprisingly, yes. Pierre, remember when I told you no one would ever kiss you? Yes, sire. Well, <laughs> pucker up, boyo. Yay. When Napoleon left Elba, it wasn't really the daring escape you might think. He basically had kind of a leaving ceremony, hopped on a ship, and sailed back to France. He brought with him an army of about a thousand men, and he began his journey to Paris. However, in Paris, there was now a new king, and at first, the people largely accepted him because the last few years of war under Napoleon had brought immense death and economic suffering. That's right, the king is back, baby. Divine right to rule. Don't worry, everyone. I know the economy is kaput, but I and my courtiers will withdraw into this palace and we will definitely work as hard as we can <laughs> to fix everything. <laughs> oh yeah, that's why we got rid of the king. As the Bourbon monarchy began to look more and more like a return to the past and the returning nobility seemed hellbent on regaining their lost privileges, the people weren't too happy. And so, Napoleon hoped that his glorious return would be met with jubilation. In the end, the reaction was a little mixed, but many were happy to see their old emperor. Your Majesty, it seems that Napoleon is back and marching this way with a thousand men. That guy? No problem. I have hundreds of thousands of men. Send them to arrest him. Uh, Your Majesty, it seems the thousands of men we sent to arrest Napoleon have all joined his side. What? Well. I'm off to Belgium. If you ever need a king again, be sure to let me know. As Napoleon continued his journey, the king had sent battalions of men to stop him, but they largely comprised of Napoleon's old soldiers, many unhappy with King Louis's military reforms. And so, when ordered to arrest him, they simply couldn't do it. In one famous incident, the troops began to cry out, Long live the emperor. When Napoleon reached hmm. Paris, with King Louis having fled, he entered unopposed to reclaim his throne. Napoleon was back from the dead. Okay, everyone, now that we've finally gotten rid of that guy, let's try to make sure something like this can never happen again. What's that doing there? Hey, fellow monarchs. <laughs> this time, Napoleon promised he would be a mucho mucho good boy and not start any wars. But the Allied leaders were having none of it. They declared Napoleon an outlaw and the illegitimate ruler of France. Then they declared war. Uh -uh. Not on France but on Napoleon himself. And when you have multiple empires declaring war on you as an individual, that's how you know you're a very naughty boy. The Allied powers began making plans to combine their forces and once again invade France. The most immediate threat to Napoleon were the British and Prussians hanging out in nearby Belgium. If Napoleon could knock them out quickly, maybe he could force the Allies to negotiate and maybe he could hold on to his power. Together, the two armies to the north outnumbered him, so he made a plan to divide them and take them on separately. Historians debate how much of a chance Napoleon had here, but this same strategy of dividing and conquering had worked for him multiple times. He marched north with 125,000 men hmm. and took on the Allies in a number of initial engagements, defeating the Prussians before turning to take on the British. But to Napoleon's dismay, miscommunication and hesitation among his marshals allowed both enemy armies to retreat. And crucially, rather than fleeing east, the Prussians moved north where they could remain in contact with the British. Napoleon sent a force to hold off the Prussians as he moved in on the British, now holding a defensive position at Waterloo. Prussian General Blücher sent word that he would come to Wellington's aid if he could just hold off the French for long enough. Napoleon had to defeat Wellington before the Prussian army could arrive in force, and it was close. The British held the high ground and a number of key defensive buildings across the battlefield. After waiting some hours he didn't have for the ground to dry, Napoleon sent men to assault the Hougoumont farm, but the British German garrison there held out. 
French Marshal Ney launched a number of miscalculated cavalry charges at the British lines. The British formed defensive square formations, and they tore the French cavalry to shreds. While well, one guy chose the absolute worst time to go on a bender. The French did manage to capture a farmhouse directly in front of the British line, and from there, they unleashed artillery hellfire on the British square formations. And as Napoleon sent his Imperial Guard in to finish the British off, a nervous Wellington knew his lines were at breaking point. But the Prussians had earlier begun to arrive, and now they were arriving in large numbers. And after the British held out and sent the French Imperial Guard running, the French lines panicked, fearing they had been encircled, and they began to flee. The Battle of Waterloo was an Allied victory. And with that, Napoleon's hopes of returning to glory were vanquished. He knew he was defeated. He went to the British and said, Can I please have a house near London? <laughs> and the British replied, No. Instead, to make sure Napoleon was put away once and for all, they sent him to one of the most isolated and remote places they could think of. A tiny island in the Atlantic Ocean. Damn. St. Helena. Here, a deeply isolated and depressed Emperor Napoleon would live the remaining years of his life. Wow. His house was a wooden bungalow, not exactly on par with the Tuileries Palace. Much to his frustration, his captors referred to him as general, rather than calling him emperor. His mail was censored. His visitors were vetted. There was almost... Some of these islands in the Atlantic Ocean, are they actually inhabitable? Are people living there? Like, with, like that house that Napoleon was living, like, that is actually... Uh, are those kind of houses existing in those kind of islands? Like that St. Helena Island. I mean, I used to think some of these islands are just there, like... You know, there are thousands of islands in the, in the Atlantic Ocean. I just thought that, that they're just there and nobody's living there. Wow, that, that means that people living there. Wow. No way he could escape such an isolated island. But just to be sure, he was guarded by 2,000 <laughs> soldiers and two ships that circled the island 24 wow. hours a day. He had once been the most powerful man alive. And images of the victorious Napoleon depict a strong leader, hand firmly in jacket. Hmm. Depictions of Napoleon on St. Helena show a disheveled old man, hand firmly in pants. He had lost everything. And by the way, he was only 46. Damn. So maybe it's about time you... Um, you know what? You're doing all right, kid. Napoleon fought one last battle while on the island. The battle for his reputation. He spent hours writing his memoirs, hmm. espousing his achievements, recording his greatness, and turning himself and his story into a phenomenal legend. Yes. And in this battle, he certainly succeeded. His mark on history cannot be denied. After his defeat, the European monarchs had got to work restoring Europe to its traditional balance and reasserting their dominance. But after Napoleon had spread the influence of the French Revolution, these returning monarchs would have a difficult time regaining their absolute control. France returned to the rule of the Bourbons, but it would go on to stage another revolution, and then another one. Wow. Reaction to Napoleon's rule in places like Germany and Italy propelled forward the ideas and feelings of modern unity and nationalism, and his Napoleonic code still remains the basis of law in various modern countries. The modern world owes a lot to Napoleon's legacy. Yeah. He remains statistically possibly the greatest military general in history, and his revolutionary military tactics changed list. the face of warfare. He was, and then another one, Napoleon's legacy. He remains statistically possibly the greatest military general in Okay, Napoleon, Julius Caesar, okay, Duke of Wellington, I don't know who that is. Takeda Shingen, I don't know who that is. I don't know any other, okay, I, apart from, okay, I know Ulysses Grant. Was he not one of those people? I can't remember, wait, was he not in the American Civil War or the uh, American Revolution? One of those two videos. Um, Frederick the Great, I think I've heard that name before. Of course, Alexander the Great. Okay. History and his revolutionary military tactics changed the face of warfare. He was the last truly great leader to both lead his armies in battle while retaining total political control over a vast empire. Yeah. There's still hope for Joe Biden, <laughs> but the man remains somewhat of an enigma, and we still aren't sure exactly what to make of him in some regards. Was he the champion of the French Revolution, spreading equality wherever he went, or did he betray it by making himself an absolute monarch and restricting certain liberties? Was he an ambitious and aggressive conqueror, hell he was ambitious bringing for sure. Europe to its knees? Or was he simply defending himself against an aggressive Europe, hellbent on reducing his power? Some things will continue to be debated. Napoleon died at the age of 51, officially of stomach cancer, but some believe he may have been poisoned. 
The British buried him in a tin coffin, inside a mahogany coffin, inside a lead coffin, yeah. inside another mahogany hell? coffin. I guess this time, they wanted to make sure he stayed where they put him. <laughs> in 1840, his remains were moved to Paris, where they now rest under the dome of Les Invalides. The man from humble origins, with huge ambition, ruthless determination, immaculate skill on the battlefield, and a hefty dose of luck, who was determined to make his mark on history, did just that. There is no immortality, he said, but the memory that is left in the minds of yes. men. And in that sense, Napoleon knew he would live on forever. forever. Yeah. Oh, and to reiterate, he was definitely average height for the time. <laughs> wow, guys, like <laughs> when I was watching the video, I was my mind was my mind was just in the video like <sighs> When I watch this kind of videos, I can't really make comments like that. I'll make comments, but I can't really, you know, I guess I'm trying to hear everything, trying to get all the points. And to be honest with you, I'm a fan of Napoleon because um, for a guy, for a person that came from a low background and, you know, people look at him like he's you know maybe he was short i don't know maybe he was just average height whatever and also that it was not it was ugly or what whatever it, it, it was but for that kind of man to be able to rise to the top like that and be able to lead thousands of men against the whole of europe i mean like when i when i think about that sometimes i just I, I'm just marveled. I'm just marveled by these men in the past, the men of those days that were, that were able to do that. It's not like today's leaders that just sit behind the desk and send people to go and die. These people, this guy, and most of the leaders of that time, they would be in the front line fighting with the men. I can imagine being a soldier and your leader is fighting with you. I mean, that is probably one of the best feelings ever. Anyway, guys, I really enjoyed that and I was really looking forward to this video and I'm glad that I finally watched it. I hope you guys enjoyed the reaction. I'll see you next time. Peace.